Here we have, here we have well-known craftsman from down east, Dean Look, who is scraping in a bearing to fit on the end of the axle for ASL 100. And here he goes, dropping it in. There's Prussian blue dye on there, which shows the high spots. Now he's rubbing it around to see how it fits and how much is ripe, wiped off. And as you can see, almost nothing came off. But the high spots are right there and right there. We shall continue to scrape. How long has it been since you used one of those scrapers? Try. Quite a while ago? 1963. <laughs> In a what? <laughs> yeah, 1963. Don. Actually, that's uh, scraping fairly fast. I'm surprised. It is. It is. But I, I, I know professional. If Dennis, if Dennis could see me, he'd scream. Why would he say that? Because oh, it, it shouldn't be coming out this rough. Right oh. There. Chattering a little bit, I suppose. Yeah, just chattering. So how do you keep from chattering? You if learn. You, if you knew, you'd do it. Yeah, yeah if I knew, I'd do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, very The cab sits on 3x3 three three ash sills, which go all the way around the periphery. We're on the side right now. It goes around the front, except for the doors. And... At the bottom of every post is a tenon, which goes into a mortise, which we'll see in a moment. And then there's a steel rod, which goes from the sill, the bottom of the longitudinal sills, all the way up through to the roof of the car and ties it together. And we had to uh, allow for that in the sills as to where this would go, and uh, so we'll show you that. Shortly, so we have had to mortise out for these tenons that will go in, and they're all the way around on every post. Okay, that's what I'm cab front. I don't know exactly where that. I guess that went over on the other end, but I'm not sure. So you might want to bring us up that you've now lowered it because you've completed the... Okay, yes. Yeah. The cab framework... I only, I only use two feet. Well... Townhouse <laughs> shop. Uh, let me see. Is Bernie out there? Uh, who is he? he went to get a cable for... Oh, he's got it. Is he... Well, he has to get another one. And the white you see is to replace what was on here and long gone. So this is unleaded white lead here, which was used as a sealer. And we put it on as carefully as they did originally. We found uh, traces of it had run down, uh, that we didn't do it deliberately, but we see why they had that problem. And that was a protective coat to, to we also sealed up, checked and sealed up all the cracks and any holes that were in the original uh, timbers. Now most of these, except for the one way over near this end, are a, a new top, so they, there wouldn't be any holes. But we patched it up to, and patched, uh, caulked all around wherever water could possibly go in. So we hope we'll be all right. Uh, we can't, I don't know if you can see any wiring looking down through there. Uh, a little bit, probably not worth it. Just a little bit. Uh, The car is now lowered down. Uh, we've had it way up a foot higher and then we lowered it down because the next step is going to be to work on the deck. So we had to get it to a point where I, being not quite so tall, had to find it convenient. We lowered the deck down approximately a foot so it was convenient. In fact, we got down as low as we had uh, horses that would go underneath to hold it. So that it's now convenient to work on the deck. Uh, now, let's look at the the so. first thing we had to do was make sure that we had the cab sills in place. These are ash 
approximately three inches square white ash, which is what the originals were made of. And they go around forming the exact frame of the cab. We measured many times. Also, there were old holes in the sill, which was able, made it possible to locate these things, we think, pretty darn close to where the originals were. Um, the, as we mentioned earlier, the cab, and we can point to the same spot. The cab has uh, posts which go this way that have tenons that go down and into these mortises here. And then this is where the steel rod goes, all the way to the bottom of the sill, where it can then be bolted and uh, tightened up. Uh, some of the places, they just have a bolt going through. There, there are not rods in every corner. There's about 10 of them all the way around. Uh, this is the door frame. The framing, is, there's no framework right here. I'm not quite sure how it works because the original was rotted away, but we'll figure that out, I'm sure. Uh, so this is bolted down, and this uh, is mortise in here so the bolt doesn't turn. The bolt's 13 inches long, as you can see, right on there. Just as an example of what we uh, were facing, this is a, an old piece. We think it came from this location, and because it was uh, where the there was a window that went down into a pocket right above that and was open sometime, the water got in and caused some rot here. There's the same mortise as you find right here. And this little piece is kind of interesting. This is because the windows, you can look over here and see where the cab is, the windows slid down and this was to keep them from smashing in the bottom. It's a little bit of rubber. And so we'll put the same thing right, like right here and there probably was another one over there. This is another piece of the cab floor. I don't know which way it is up here. You can see it's suffered, or the cab sill, I should say. Uh, didn't really get much clothes. We, we had enough, uh, by looking at some of the old ones and by, there's still some stuff inside of the cab wall. You see the cab wall will come down here. The sheathing on the outside will go vertically here. And then there's wainscoting on the inside, which will, will go here. So there's a, it's supposed to be about a three-quarter inch space, which we just set these in yesterday. So we might as well talk about the flooring and so forth. What you see in here is the original flooring put back in the same order that it was originally. Uh, and the reason we're planning to use this is because it will be a historical part of the car showing the wear marks that were created by the motorman that stood in the corners. You can see how it looks like the waves of the ocean where they were have worn down. And that you have that in the diagonal opposite corners. The big hole is where the wires come up to the controller, which and you can almost see the outline of the controller where it's not worn. And then the pipes go up to the air brake valve, or the engineer's valve as it's called. Uh, there's going to be one problem with laying this out exactly as it was. Uh, when the, when, before we did anything, we looked down at, at the, the floor and the, you could put your finger between almost every one of these and uh, the tongue, this is tongue and groove wood, the tongue is supposed to go into a groove here. Well, the wood had shrunk to the point that the tongues pulled out, so essentially the tongue did absolutely nothing. Now, the question is, do we pull this together so that it was tight like it was built, or do we lay these down as close as we can to where they were originally, and there'll still be lots of space? It certainly would be easier if we didn't have to try to get the tongues to mate up because uh, they, they're they kind of beat up and they I don't think that they would go down very well. But anyway, we're going to keep as much as we can of this original historical wood here and it will be protected inside so it doesn't have to be necessarily waterproof. It's hard to tell if there was ever any paint on this or not. Now this is over in a place where people would not walk and there's no trace a paint on it right now. They might have used an oil of some kind on it, but you can't tell. The uh, Out here, under the hood, 
this we're now outside of the actual cab. Uh, there's lots and lots of oil because the air compressor sat here and it leaked a lot of oil over many years. So these boards are saturated with oil and as a result they're preserved uh, so that they're almost like new. Uh, getting back inside, looking at this end. There are a lot of things that have to go through the cab. Uh, one of This is a wire that goes down through that hole where the, the power comes from overhead, the trolley overhead, and goes down and eventually ends up in the controller right there. That's where the wires come through. Over here, all these uh, pipes for the air brake have to make their way through, and uh, it was impossible to get them to go back exactly as they were, so we may have to modify this area. At some point, they came up through these holes, and I don't uh, uh, remember, but I have pictures of it showing whether they actually came through the holes or whether they just used a notch to put them in. Because coming through the holes, again, would be very, very difficult to do. So we may have to modify things a little bit. Uh, so I think that's, that's it for this. Alrighty. This is a wiring diagram for the title, as it says there, K35 G2 controllers and four motors, which is just what this car had originally. It's uh, a very simple control. This car had no line switch, which was a, a special extra switch they made, uh, and no special anythings on the control. So we're very lucky in, in that it's easy to do. So this was our diagram, and it shows, uh, this is a simplified diagram of the way it is, and then this is laid out the whole schematic. There's motor number one, two, three, four. The resistors, which control the speed of the motors, are down here. And there's controller number one and controller number two. They don't show that completely because it's the same as controller number one. It shows the electricity comes in through this overhead wire goes through a big circuit breaker, goes down through this wire and into the controller. Now that is the same wire we showed a minute ago that was down in under the floor. This, of course, is schematic, so the actual roots of the wires is not exactly the same. So using this, uh, we laid the wires out. There are seven wires going to the resistors, R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We put those all into one hose. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, motors one and two we put in another hose, and then three and four we put in a, in a third hose. And then, uh, I can't concentrate. Uh, what we've done is we've laid the wires out uh, rather than having one big lump, one big mess uh, going from one end to the other. We've broken them up into uh, the resistors and a pair of mo motors one and two and motors three and four. And the wires essentially, uh, one wire for instance, the wire for motor one, number one would start right up here, go down across and up to the other controller, tapping off to motor number one. That's what these little things are. Then motor number two, same thing, would tap off to number two and then eventually go up to here. And then motor number three would go over to here, tap off, and go back up to here. So the, there's, there's about uh, 20 feet of wire from here to here. Um, and we put them inside of a canvas hose, which uh, I don't think I have and we put them inside of a canvas hose, which uh, I don't think I have. I just put some of it away this morning. And that's what's going to be hard to see. Uh, we followed what they did in the old days, which was to put wire in a hose, but you can almost, I don't know whether you can see all the way over there. Yeah. yeah this is canvas fire hose, no yeah. longer made. In fact, I think that even might be made in England. It came from the Biddeford Fire Department back in the 1970s, and even at that time it was getting hard to get. In fact, everybody was using it for padding on their docks to keep protect go uh, boats from marring themselves against a wooden dock. 
So we were able to push as many as seven wires through that cable, and it was quite a job. It took three of us to do it with wire pulling compound on it. Then at the end, we wrapped around with friction tape, and then these wires are loose because uh, at this point they break up and, and there are different resistor grids here, and each one goes to a different spot. Uh, the wires were then, these uh, were fastened to each sill with a leather strap, fastened in with shingle nails, just exactly the way the original did, and they're all fastened in there. There are a few uh, other wires. There's one for the uh, ground, which runs the whole length. It's a heavy wire. It goes from one end of the car to the other, and that's the trolley wire is hot. That's where it comes in. Eventually, after it's done its work, the, the wire has to, uh, the electricity has to go back out to the tracks and hence back to the power station. So what we did, uh, and we did what they did ordinarily or originally. You can see that on the other side, I guess. Hopefully, you may have to get down a little bit. Uh, well, there you can see the hose, and you can see the yeah. uh, the leather strap, and the ground wire is that single wire that's way inside there. That's fastened with metal straps, because the ground wire really, uh, even though it carries electricity, it's not at a potential that's going to be harmful, so the metal was cheaper and easier to use. Uh, so what they did is they had a bolt on the bolster, on the bolster. Well, we'd have to get a light to show that. Maybe, we better, right. maybe we better do that yeah. okay. some other time. Yeah. Uh, but there's some very fancy uh, connections that I had to make. This wire right here is for the headlight. The headlight gets its power, and it also is a frame that sits on there, and it's, there's a bolt that holds the frame on, and it, that extends down through the wood, and there's a wire fastened to that for, for the ground. And that'll be more obvious when we, okay. when we put the thing together.